Good morning, and thanks for coming out today. Really nice to see you here, and really nice to be here. It's been a couple of years, actually, since I was. And uh, this is different from the last time I was here. Yes, I need glasses to be able to see what I'm uh, talking about. Um, so I, I've really been very interested in um, ways that uh, ethical humanists can positively impact the world around us. Um, there's just so many things that are happening that are of concern. Um, and finding uh, ways to help things get better um, can be a bit of a challenge. So, so I guess it's no secret that the uh, federal government of the United States is in a bit of a mess. We have a president who's been accused of a number of bad behaviors and inter-party conflict between Democrats and Republicans over the accusations and over the repercussions of those behaviors for the president. For the purposes of today's talk, I'd like to focus on the moral elements of that conflict, not to choose sides and pick a winner. I assume you've already done that yourselves. Uh, but rather to demonstrate how opposing groups can claim the moral high ground, even though they can't both be right. I believe this is important because however things turn out regarding impeachment or the results of the 2020 presidential election, the inter-party conflict is bound to continue and likely intensify over the coming months. That divisive conflict is, to my mind, much more dangerous than whomever is chief executive. And finding ways to get beyond the party line divisions is necessary to avoid disaster. And let's remember that the inter-party conflicts we're seeing in the United States are not restricted to the United States. There's problems developing all over the world on this front. So how to unpack the idea that both Democrats and Republicans are claiming the moral high ground? Rather than look at the relative merits of the moral arguments being made, let's look at morality from a functional perspective. How does morality work within a group? I've been inspired uh, by uh, the work of Jonathan Haidt. Uh, anyone Jonathan Haidt readers here? Okay, all right, don't hate me. I know that for many people in the liberal uh, world, uh, the Jonathan Haidt is a bit of a, a problematic character, uh, given a number of his opinions about things. Um, but I found his recent book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, uh, to really have a particularly challenging uh, quality about it. And, uh, it's one of those things that I find he's raised so many important issues that really deserve to be looked at and, and dealt with. Um, a good chunk of what he's saying is that if you look at morality from a functional point of view, it can really help you understand the things that you're seeing in the world around you. Um, so he looks at morality from an evolutionary perspective. Right? Uh, so if we assume that people are at heart largely self-interested, right, which generally we can say is, seems to be true of most uh, human beings anyway, that is they, they tend to uh, look to do things that they expect will work out well for them and, and uh, improve their lives. Uh, not that they always do that reliably, but probably anticipate doing that. Right? So people at least have a self-interested sensibility um, but if that is the case, how do we uh, account for people uh, participating in self-sacrificial behaviors, right? When people rush in to save a drowning child they don't know, or you know, name the thing that you can think of that's self-sacrificial. How do we explain that happening if people are in fact self, uh, self-interested, right? Um, and what Hyde is saying is that if you look within your own social group, uh, chances are you're being a bit selfish can actually work out rather nicely, right? It helps you identify and get, uh, capture resources that you will find uh, exciting and, and useful for you. Um, and on the whole, as long as you're pretty clear about what is good for you and what isn't, um, you can pursue those ends uh, without too much interference. The thing is, when you're in a situation where groups are competing with groups, that self-interested behavior is not much less uh, helpful, right? 
So uh, one of the things I say is like, you know, uh, the, the group that is really well organized in battle, for instance, is much more likely to, to win, right? But the people most likely to come home and father more children are the people who don't join the fight, right? Uh, people who desert can get home faster, for all that matter. Uh, and so, you know, you have this issue there. If there isn't some way to promote other than self-interest, you don't have a strong encouragement for groups to organize and to do things that go beyond the self-interested behavior. Right, with me so far? Okay. So uh, Darwin actually, Charles Darwin was, was pretty interested in this too. Um, and uh, he said that there are basically four steps that he would imagine would be happening in evolution that would lead toward what he would call groupish behavior. So the first are social instincts. Um, and it says in, in ancient times, loners were more likely to get picked off by predators than were their more gregarious siblings. Uh, those people who felt a strong need to stay close to the group had at least a few other people around. Uh, what, what is that old thing about, uh, you know, two guys are running away from a tiger and one stops to put his sneakers on? And the guy says, no, you can't outrun a tiger with sneakers. And the guy says, I don't need to outrun the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> looking at his friend who's not wearing sneakers. Anyway, so, you know, the, you get the idea, right? Okay, so uh, those people who were able to stick together uh, have a, a stronger uh, survivability uh, in tough times. Reciprocity. People who helped others were more likely to get help when they needed it, right? Uh, there's an old tit-for-tat thing, you know. Uh, what they find is that people in general are likely to have a positive attitude towards someone um, when they um, meet them for the first time, except if the person disses them, they'll remember that, right? And so the next time around, it will be and not nearly as positive. So what they say is, you know, when you help people out, you can generate some level of positive regard, and then when you need help, you can call in those chicks. Right? And, and that's something that, uh, that can, can work in your favor. Right? Um, and that also does tend to lead toward people doing more things together. And quite honestly, there's a number of things that you need help with, right? You can't do it by yourself, so it's important <coughs> that other people join in with you. All right. Um, but he says the most important stimulus to the development of social virtues was the fact that people are passionately concerned with the praise and blame of their fellow human beings. And that those who lacked a sense of shame or love of glory were less likely to attract friends and mates. So what Darwin is saying is at the core of, uh, of, of morality uh, and of social gathering is this sense that people are really very concerned about their reputations within their group that if you are not being well respected by the people around you, that is a big deal. Now, let's think again about the current political uh, crisis, right? You have these two groups that are, are warring. Within those groups, though, people are really sticking together, right? Um, and they're holding fast to particular ideas that if they were to vary from them would generally have some real consequences for the people that vary, all right? So basically, you can look at the functional qualities of morality as being those things within a group that encourage people to engage in pro-social behavior, right? Those things that may not be particularly great for them personally, but will really help the group. Um, and also do some kind of disincentivizing people who would otherwise uh, slack off, free ride, let other people do the work, um, or in other ways disrupt uh, the work of the group that is trying to get done, all right? So if you look at your own morality system, right? In other words, we, we each are, are working within them. <coughs> Try to take in mind, what does it mean for you to be in sync with the people you care about and the people that are part of your community, so to speak. And what is it like to drop out of sync with that? Right? 
Notice that the feeling that you might get if you were finding yourself at odds with people within your community about an idea, and you get a handle on how uh, morality works to organize people toward the common work of, of a particular group of people. Right. So the thing is, um, what leads to uh, groups uh, really becoming cooperative as, as species are uh, a few particular kind of things. Uh, the first is a need to defend a shared nest. Right? So one of the things you find with bees and ants and other kinds of uh, colony animals is oftentimes they are structured or around a, a place where they share um, and around ways to protect that. Right? Uh, Kind of similar for human beings around the neighborhoods. The need for, to feed offspring over an extended period, which gives an advantage to species that re recruit siblings or males to help out mom. Now, definitely human beings have probably the record in terms of how long it takes to get our kids out of the house. Um, and, and even after that, we still be feeding them. Uh, fed my son lunch just yesterday. It's not a bad and uh, so that's one of those pieces, though. When you have a lot of need along those lines, there are good reasons to come together, right? There are good reasons to put a few things aside to make sure you have food in the fridge or food in the cabinets or whatever else um, so that you can ensure that people continue. From an evolutionary point of view, what is uh, the measure of success? Anyone? Reproduction, right? So, so success equals reproduction. So all these things that really help you survive to make more of yourself or more of people like you um, is kind of what they're, they're talking about in terms of uh, advantage here. All right? And the third thing that really helps groups become groupish is intergroup conflict. Right? If you have enemies, chances are very strong that you will be leading towards organizing around uh, certain kinds of things that help people uh, engage in self-sacrificial behavior and that punish people who don't engage. I live in uh, Westchester County, New York, um, which is uh, an area that was colonized fairly early by uh, uh, Western Europeans. Uh, the people that were living there when the Europeans arrived um, were many different Native American groups and uh, one of the things that was common for them is that they would build their places, uh, the, their, uh, their communities around places that were easy to defend because they are quite aware that there are other groups just like them um, and that when you're trying to uh, live within a particular environment, uh, there are good chances that you'll be competing over the resources. And if you are competing over resources, there's not a bad chance that things will erupt into conflict. Right? We're not immune for that, right? In other words, we're in situations where we uh, are still in a place of uh, potential conflict where we think what people want will be somehow problematic for us. The, the problem uh, is that when people do get involved in intergroup conflicts, they have a very hard time seeing beyond their own group's needs and expectations. So, uh, when you have people that, uh, what, what Hyde says is uh, morality both binds and blinds, right? So uh, the binding quality is when you have common culture that says, okay, we're going to work together, we're going to do these sorts of things, et cetera, et cetera. That's binding people together, right? We have common ideas about what we're looking to do. We have common ways of sorting out who's going to do what, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, once you get there, when you have a, a common enemy, when you have a common opponent, chances are you will also be blind to what their needs are, right? In other words, your own needs, your own group's needs become paramount um, and you either don't listen to or don't care about the needs of others when they seem to conflict with your own something I think we would probably see here in our world right now. So what's needed is some mechanism to kind of get beyond your own group's particular stuff. And that's where 
Mythical humanism hopefully comes into play. Um, the, uh, the, the, well, let, let's see what people uh, can bring in uh, already around this idea. So what are the core elements of ethical humanism that uh, you, uh, you organize around? Anyone shout out? Compassion. Compassion. Social justice. Social justice. Intrinsic worth. Building strong relationships. Building strong relationships. Making the world better. Making the world better. All right. So you have some sense that it's, these are things that are kind of the, the larger issues, and there, there's basically, uh, but like three core ideas that, that drive a lot of this. Right. The first idea is uh, the sense that people are deemed worthy. Um, and are to be treated as ends and ends of themselves and not simply as means to ends, right? So there's something intrinsically valuable or worthy about individuals. Um, and in ethical culture world, also that means unique individuals. That is, there's an expectation that each person has their own special qualities. Uh, so in addition to being worthy anyway, there are also uh, really interesting and special things about each person that uh, you'd like to become more aware of and, and, and uh, work with, right? So that's one of the items. Another item has to do with the transactional quality of uh, ethical culture, which is the golden rule of ethical culture, which is? Act so as to bring out the best of others. Thereby yourself. Right. Act so as to elicit the best of others and thereby elicit the best of oneself. There's a few different variations on that. Uh, bring out the best, elicit the best, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is the idea that it's people's relationship and engagement that makes it possible for people to grow into their ethical capacity. Right? So that's two. So the third has to do with the direction of things. Right? And that is that we are looking to do this in such a way that people, when people's qualities emerge, they uh, emerge in a direction that leads to a world that has more compassion in it, and that is fair for everyone. So when we're looking to organize, it is a big challenge for us, right? Because we're not in, uh, in good stead if we just stick to our own needs, right? Or if we just kind of look small at the world, we're looking to uh, try to help a larger world move into a special place. So the, the three elements of ethical humanism I think are important when we're trying to organize are, uh, are things that <clears throat> begin with T. All right, so the first would be uh, 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 transcendence. Do you guys talk about transcendence here? Yeah, probably some. Okay. Um, you know, I think in religious cultures, transcendence is often uh, uh, spoken about quite a lot. In ethical societies, maybe more, maybe less. What I'm looking to here are what are those aspects of our effort that go beyond just the usual stuff. It's, a, it's my issue with the word secular. I think secular doesn't reach enough for me to feel like it can get beyond the intergroup conflicts that I think are, are, are worrisome and, and dangerous for us. Um, but finding ways to get past that is not so easy. Um, a second piece would be transactional, right? So the idea here is that we are engaged in activity in our own lives and with the people that we come across. So there's a very strong person-to-person -person quality and a very strong quality that is our relationship with one another that holds the promise for things being good, right? And things uh, changing. And then the third aspect is one of the transformational quality of those uh, interactions, right? In other words, that at the end of the day, people become different as a result of their activity than when they started, 
All right, we've got those three things. So how would that play out in a uh, in something in a, a let's say a uh, a team that was working from an ethical society? Uh, do you guys have teams here? Committees. Committees. Uh, okay. Uh, is there anyone in the room who is a member of a committee? Ah, I like it. All right. Um, how about so, if someone willing to volunteer uh, to work on this? Because uh, what, what I'm looking to do at this juncture is kind of pull together some ideas about how your committee um, would work towards uh, behaving in such a way that they were transcendent, transactional, um, and transformative. So this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. Volunteers. <laughs> Volunteer means you, you come up and, and we have an interview and then the, you have helplines with the other folks in the room. Anyone game? All right, I knew there'd be at least one person. Henry, thank you. Why? Is that a long term commitment? I think it's going to be a commitment for about 10 to 15 minutes. Come on. Uh, tell me, uh, Henry, what is it that you are uh, involved with? I'm, I'm the chair, actually, of, of, uh, of, of the Camp of Linden. Uh, Camp Linden? Yeah. Camp Linden Committee. Okay. Are you coming up, too? I'm coming up, too. Excellent. Come on over. Uh-oh. Do I have to say what I'm involved in? Sure. In, like, all of ethical culture in Philadelphia. Uh, let's uh, fill it up, yeah. Okay. I sometimes try to gather the cats that are young people in the Philadelphia <laughs> ethical culture. The young people, young adults. Okay, so one thing that actually holds the two of you together is you have an interest in younger people. Would yeah. you say that's, uh... I would not say it like that. Okay. <laughs> interest in building community and making the larger community welcoming to young adults. All right. And would you be willing to work with Henry in this minute uh, to uh, figure out around Camp Linden uh, the, uh, how to organize a team that would be working towards transcendence? Sounds like a long-term commitment. Right? Yeah. Actually, actually, yeah. Go ahead. Actually, it just sounds to me awfully vague. Yeah. And it sounds as if it couldn't easily be particularized into action. Okay. And, and what I, I find at actually in uh, at our committee is that uh, we are, actually have uh, critical issues that have to be ad, ad, addressed. Okay. And so let's do this. Let, wait, let's wait, 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 go. Okay. If, if it is. Uh, Grants uh, formative in any way that's almost by app accident. Okay, so um, we're, we're looking at the aspirations of it at this juncture. So the first piece that I would be wondering about: what are the aims of the Camp Linden effort? Uh, the aim is to continue up actually uh, to provide the uh, s uh, uh, s services that we are, are, are uh, providing mm -hmm. in uh, spite of all of the issues and, and the uh, problems that we have to deal with on the way and, and there are many okay and christian you're familiar with camp linden i am uh, and all right so we're talking about working with 
the campus for children, correct? It, it is, yes. Okay, and what is it you hope will happen with the children because they've been part of the campus? Uh, there is an ed educational aspect in it, which is important. Mm -hmm. And there is a uh, transactional part of it that is important also. And we only hope that they get enough out of it for it to be a trans uh, formative in a, a way, but that's our hope. And it's not easy to measure. Right. And what what kind of things would you like to see the kids transform to? In other words, are there aspects, are there things that are the aims for the children that attend from uh, the camp's point of view? That I would have to defer that to uh, 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 Sharon here, uh, who is more in, into it. Okay. Are, are you game to uh, tell us a little bit more about what you aim to do with that camp? Thanks. Um, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah. yeah. Our mission is to provide a camp experience for inner city children that promotes appreciation of the natural world acknowledges the intrinsic worth of all human beings and encourages campers to develop self-reliance, integrity, and ethical relationships. And um, we also have, we have our, that's our mission. And we have our Camp Linden values, which we have a lesson on Camp Linden values every day. And the values are value yourself Keep yourself safe and open to experience and learning. Two, value other people, especially those, especially your fellow campers. Keep them safe and help them to learn. And three, value the earth and all living things, especially those encountered at camp. Learn from observing nature and leave things as you found them. And that's those are our, our values and what we're trying to inculcate in the children. I can tell you how we do it, mm -hmm. which is that we partner with organizations that run summer camps for inner city families. Mm -hmm. And they, our partners bring a group of kids to Camp Linden on the same weekday for six weeks or five weeks. And we have a program that consists of what values is one of the things we do. We have an environmental education program, which we do half a day, and a swimming program we do half a day. So we have two groups that each day that switch. Sometimes both groups come from the same organization and they're divided in half. Sometimes we have two different organizations on the same day. Okay, and the team of, the committee of people working on it, how many people are on your committee? And Henry? Maybe about eight of us. About eight people on the committee. All right. And are you feeling that your committee works as a team reasonably well? Uh, yeah. I, I didn't <laughs> say. Uh, but, I, I don't want to be pushed any of part of them. Well, yeah, look, it's always a matter of degree, right? Teams are always getting something done, and sometimes they can do more than other times. And it sounds like you're in a place now where you're in the middle of that, right? And so you're you're working on it. Thank you for helping me out with this. Well, the team. I mean, it actually we regard this as a program of the Philadelphia Ethical Society. Um, the Camp Linden Committee has a special role in terms of governance and guidance. But the team is anybody who is interested in helping out. So we have people who volunteer regularly who are not on the Camp Linden Committee. We go out 
um, on work days. Henry's been the volunteer coordinator for several years now. And you know, we plant the garden because of this, the season of camp, we can't expect the kids to plant and then harvest. So we plant so that they can harvest. And what do you find is the, something inspiring about your work with the camp? Well, Okay. Henry, do you want to go? Uh, <laughs> children. The children. The children. Well, hold on a second. Let it go. I, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> I, I recall an incident, and since I'm the ed editor of, of, uh, of, of the uh, eth Ethical Society newsletter also, I, I had an in in the letter in which uh, Leonard, who's Karen's husband and is e equally in, in, involved, was e explaining to s some children about in insects and he had them in a, a small group, and he was uh, uh, showing them how these in insects act. And what came out of this was just a feeling of wonder on, on the part of the kids, you know, and they would say, I, I don't know that. You know, there is all this in my area, all this here, and and they are just uh, doing all these interesting things. And I, I was thinking, hey, you know, this is an intrinsic part of everyone's ed education, and if, if it isn't, it just ought, ought to be. And here we are contributing this one small effort to encourage aspiration. You know, if, if all these insects here will do this, how about everything out, out, out there? How about everything at home? What's happening here? You know, and so interesting. Yeah. All right. Explore. So, so just a quick observation is um, how much more animated you are talking about the inspirational aspects of this, right? I mean, it, it's something that um, I can feel is uh, heartfelt, right? And, uh, and, and close to things that you really care about. Yeah, um, and this is an important thing for us to be aware of when we're looking at whatever committees we're joining, whatever teams we're part of, right? What are the things that inspire us about this, right? And what are the pieces of this that we're aiming for are um, worthwhile for us um, and, and are important for us to continue? And then we can start talking about, okay, so how are we doing this in a way that is sustainable, right? But the first, it really needs to start from the inspiration. And I see you yeah. pick up. Well, I just, I mean, this newsletter, everybody has to get this newsletter and read it. Um, but anyway, um, I will, uh, it starts with a card. We got cards from two of the groups that came. Um, and, and they were really adorable. We couldn't put them all in the newsletter. We, we had just, just one right here that says, I love Camp Linen, a little slight misspelling, but the thought is there. Um, and also some quotes from the, which is our feedback from the kids. Thank you for a fun time every Tuesday. We have the best day. Thank you for everything. That's one. Thank you for a wonderful time and learning about things I did not know. Um, I love to swim in the pool. I like the creek because we skipped rocks. I love walking like Indians in the forest. And there's an article about Leonard's nature program um, where they walk like Indians in the forest and also um, I like catching bugs and toads using our hands. I love feeding the goats. So those are just a few of the things that the kids told us in their cards. 
Um, they also tell us, I mean, particularly like the last day of camp when we have our closing celebration, and they come up and they embrace the counselors and they're really, you know, they're, they're so sorry to be leaving, but they're really grateful for the summer experience. And that, I mean, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that we see, especially for the kids who've not been there before, a, a real change in their attitude towards nature. And this year we had only one group that had not been to Camp Linden before at all. Um, and they came the first day and they were griping. They didn't like the outdoors. It was dirty. It was buggy. Um, by the time camp was over, they didn't want to leave. And they're one of the groups, that was the Tuesday group, that one of the groups that gave us these wonderful cards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, a, a hand for our people coming up. Thanks so much. All right, so while we do this, well, my belief is that, is anyone here running for Congress? <laughs> Probably not, right? Um, but my guess is you would like to have a positive impact on the world that you are living in. Um, and a way you can do that is by really getting involved with things that you care about, right? Um, and what's really important about that is finding those things that are truly worthwhile for you and for your community and for the broader world around you. You know, the ethical humanist idea is that your, our call is to really benefit everyone, not just ourselves, not just our close friends, not just our families or the people in our neighborhood, but, but everyone. And to continue to work in such a way that we're leaning in that direction. Um, and to my mind, focusing our attention on things that we can do positively can only have a beneficial effect for you and for the world around you. Um, and in contrast to that, we can spend our time, you know, bickering and arguing and uh, trying to compete uh, with, with other people and things along those lines. Uh, and my guess is that will certainly be something interesting and, and take up time and energy and all. I don't know that it's going to have the same level of positive impact, however, that being part of a project that you care about and that you support can do for you and for the world around you. So often I think we allow ourselves to become in competition rather than cooperation to uh, focus on issues of, uh, of, of conflict rather than uh, cooperation. And that isn't doing us uh, a big favor, uh, locally or worldwide. So I want to close up with a couple of, uh, oh, where did it go now? The downside about electronic stuff is you can't just put page markers in there in the same kind of way. Where did it go? Uh, so there are two quick things that I thought were helpful in terms of uh, some, some closing words here. Right. The first has to do with the importance of being in touch with the larger picture when you're going to do things. So I really am hoping that people are you know, thinking hard about the things that they volunteer to do and that they work on. Uh, and this story says, uh, two guys are digging a ditch. So I asked one of them, what are you doing? He says, I'm digging a ditch. What's it look like I'm doing? So I asked the other guy the same question, and he says, I'm building a hospital. It's a very different thing when you feel like you're working for something that goes beyond. Um, and the last is actually from uh, uh, Antoine de Saint-Zupré. My French is as bad as my other languages. Um, anyway. But uh, I just really love this. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Uh, hoping that you have that longing yourselves and are generating it, I do thank you.